How many of you have a really good question in mind already? How many of you have a good question, but you're way too scared to, answer, to ask it? Okay, so if you're way too scared to ask it, look to your left or right and find a friend who is not too scared to ask you a question for you, and I'll be able to help you out. Does that sound good? Come on over, Josh. Josh, are you a future Olympian? Yes. Okay. All right, Josh, what's your question? Come on over here. What's your question for Bria? What's your favorite food? What is your favorite food? My favorite food is the edible kind. I like the kind you can eat. So I love all foods. So I believe that your body is like a Ferrari, right? It's like a really fast car. So if you guys want to go fast, you have to fuel it right. So who in here has a hard time eating vegetables? Who here has a hard time eating salad? Did you know you can put them in smoothies? Making sure that you guys, I know sometimes they don't always taste great. I love all of them, but I know sometimes people don't. If you guys can find ways to treat yourself to eat your vegetables, it'll help you out a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, making sure that your your diet looks like a rainbow, right? Trying to get all the colors and trying to make sure none of it comes in a wrapper. So trying to eat wrapper free, super healthy. So I think my favorite food is probably pizza. Pizza. Any pizza fans out there? Oh yeah, that's a good one. All right, thank you, Josh. All right, who wants her over here? Oh, uh, you cheated. All right, she was quick. She was here at morning practice, so she gets to ask a good question. You didn't have your hand up quickly enough. Angel, Shawty, what's your question? All right, so what were the biggest obstacles and challenges that you had to face, and how did you overcome them? Biggest obstacles and challenges she faced, and how did she overcome them? There has been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But probably the most embarrassing one, you can still find on YouTube, highlighted everywhere. So in 2012, I remember feeling super confident and ready to swim. And I remember I, I went out there for prelims, and I took, the, I took my mark, I heard the buzzer, and I jumped. And I swam a very smart race and made it back to semifinals. How many people make it back to semifinals? 16 of the fastest swimmers in the world make it back to semifinals. So then we're in semifinals, and I'm feeling pretty confident. So I take my mark, I hear the buzzer, and I jump. And I swim the fastest race I can. And I touch the wall, and I look up, and it made top eight. How many people go to finals? Top eight. So super excited. And then I was going to my first Olympic final. And I remember I was studying the starter. I watched him again and again and again and again, watching all the races, just to see if he had a rhythm. And it turns out that he was kind of sending them off pretty fast. And so I knew that when I went out there, I'd have to take my mark as soon as I could. And right when I hear that buzzer, I'd have to jump. So I, that night, I visualized my start for like 30 minutes, just the start. And I knew that as soon as I hear that buzzer and jump, I'd be the first one off the block. So we got ready for finals. I walked out there and they screamed hooray for everyone. And I unfogged my goggles 15 times. And I get up on the blocks and I take my mark and I hear the buzzer and I jump. But he didn't say take your mark. So I'm through the air, and it feels like it's like 45 minutes in the air, I'm just like flying around, right? So I'm in the air, and I hit the water, and I kind of peek to the other side to see if there's any swimmers and bubbles. No swimmers, no bubbles. I was the only one that jumped in. So I realized at that moment, I had three choices. One, stay underwater forever. Two, finish the race, because I know the buzzer went off, so I was the only one, so when I was only going to walk, I would get a gold medal and everyone would be fine. Or three, I'd have to come up and see what happened. So I chose the third option, and I came up, and I looked over, and I always think it's so fun to see yourself on the Jumbotron. Does anyone like to see themselves on the Jumbotron, like the big, the big TV up in the sky? I get so excited, because wave to your mom, wave to your friends, wave to your coach. And I slowly looked over, and I saw my face on the Jumbotron. I didn't want to be on the Jumbotron anymore. 
So I slowly went over to the other side, and I had to realize a couple of things. But one, I still had a race, right? So I tried to collect myself and get ready to go, and I made another mistake in my race. Do you guys know when you're watching swimming on TV, there's an underwater camera that's on a track that goes all the way across the pool? So when I dove in, I, I was thinking to myself, instead of following my race strategy that I've worked on for years with my coach, I'm going to follow the camera instead. Do you think that was a good idea? That was a terrible idea. <laughs> so I remember thinking, if I beat the camera, I'm going to win. So I was trying to beat the camera and race in front of the camera. It turns out the camera was trying to stay in front of me. So I was just tiring myself out the whole time. And so by the time we turned and it had about 15 meters left, I just ran out of gas and I got sixth place in my individual event. And I was pretty upset. And so I had to kind of collect myself together and say, we still have one more race. We're still representing the US. And I had to get myself together ready for that. And it turned out much better. We got gold in the relay. Um, but outside of having that kind of false start, um, there have been a lot of times where I was very mean to myself in my head. Do you guys ever have that? Do you ever have that when you have a bad race and you're just really mean to yourself? You think like, why am I swimming? Why am I so slow? What am I doing wrong? You know, and, and sometimes you just don't want to go to practice. So when those things happen, what you need to do is a very simple thing, but it takes a lot of work. You need to be your own best friend. So when your best friend comes up to you and says, hey, Sarah, I am so tired. I don't want to go to school anymore. I don't want to go to practice anymore. I don't want to swim anymore. I'm just slow. What are you going to tell her? You're not going to go up to her and say mean things. You're going to say nice things, right? You're going to practice saying, hey, you worked really hard in practice. You've been doing really well in your turns. Just hang in there. Get some better sleep. Drink more water. You'll be just fine. So if you guys continue to practice being your own best friend, you'll have a better mindset and a better personal narrative to get better and faster in the water every single day. That was really great. I, I think you need to come to our practice every day. All right, be your own best friend, all right? Well, we talk about the importance of not allowing yourself to speak, speak in a way towards yourself that you wouldn't allow someone else to speak towards you. So I think that's an even more positive twist on teaching yourself to be your own best friend. All right, hold on. You guys are a bunch of pumpkin eaters. First person with their hand up. Who wants to ask? Oh, that was Sophia Duggar. Oh, I knew it. Every time at practice, she always has her hand up first. She's, been, she's really good. She's been practicing for this moment. Sophia Duggar, also known as Koala Bear. A friend's question. Out of all the sports you did, why choose this sport? Swimming. So of all the sports I've done, why did I choose swimming? So as you guys can tell, I have a lot of muscle for a girl, right? always been very powerful in all of my sports. So like I was a pitcher in softball and first baseman. My pitches weren't always straight, but they were always really fast. And when I played volleyball, if I happened to angle my hand right, no one could get it. I was very, very strong. I think in ninth grade I actually broke a bat during batting practice once. Um, so I, I love sports and I love showing a lot of power. I love using my muscles. Um, but the only thing is with, with softball, you can only pitch so many times before you have to take a break. And with volleyball, you can only hit so many times before you take a break. But in swimming, you can do the same stroke a million times without having to take a break. And so I figured out for me that's what I needed. I needed to find a, a, find a, a, a sport where I could hone in and perfect the same motion over and over and over. And my coach actually told me first day, so I don't know if you knew this, but when I was five years old, I was destined to be an Olympic gymnast. I did front cartwheels in the front yard every single day until I was 12 years old and six feet tall. Then it turns out that you have to do a lot more than that to go to the Olympics and gymnastics, right? That was a joke, you guys can laugh at that, it's okay. So, my coach told me that being a swimmer is also being an Olympic water gym gymnast. And I thought that was so cool, right? Because every single stroke you have to do has to be at the perfect angle with the right pressure, with perfect finesse. Every flip turn has to have the perfect landing. And it's like we're beautiful water dancers, right? People who look like, who make it look really easy, they work so hard to make it look easy. So when you guys are in practice and you're getting really bored, 
start focusing on your technique. So how many of you guys have done a super boring practice? Like 60, 75s, or like 40, 100s, where it gets so boring, right? Sometimes it gets so boring. So we look at our coach and we think, are you crazy? Like, why are you giving me that set? Here's the secret, okay? Here's the secret to becoming one of the best. When you get those super boring sets, that's the opportunity to get better. So let's take, let's make this an example. If coach over here gives me 4100s, oh my gosh, 4100s. So what I would do if coach gave me 4100s, I would split it up in my head. I would maybe make four sets of 10, right? So the first one, I'm gonna have the best kicking that I've ever done in my life. The second one, I'm gonna have the best turns I've ever had in my life. The third one, I'll have the best entry, the best stroke, the best breathing. Focus on the little things when you get those boring sets and they don't become boring anymore. You become super excited to go into practice and become one of the best water gymnasts in the world. Right? You just have to change your mindset. You have to make it fun. Because if I went out here and I didn't like swimming and I had to stare at a black line for four hours a day, I wouldn't have very much fun. But when I come in here, I see an opportunity. An opportunity to have the best kick in the world. An opportunity to have the best pool in the world. You guys get so many opportunities every single lap to have the perfect stroke. So if you take advantage of it and keep a smile on your face, it becomes a lot more entertaining and a lot more fun. That was pretty great. Thank you very much. All right. Over here. Are you guys ready? Who wants to ask a question? You, uh, another? Moving on. Hold on. See, the key to finding the first hand is you got to look through the crowd and then find it. All right. Who wants to ask a question? Oh, come on. Really? We'll do two from this one. So come on up. This is Christine Dadovich. Do not ask her to do a 25 pick for time. She beat Ryan Murphy a couple months ago. How did you deal with anxiety at championship meets and like overcome that in your head? Did you guys hear that? All right. All right, this is one of my favorite topics. How did you deal with anxiety? Okay, so anxiety, you need to start seeing it as a tool, right? So when you guys get all those butterflies in your stomach and how it's really hard to handle, so how many of you guys feel butterflies in different places? I feel it in my arms. Does anyone feel it in their arms? It gets kind of tingly, right? Some people feel it in their legs, some people feel it in their stomach, some people feel it on their head, right? So anxiety is you need to use as a tool. So did you know, it's a bad thing, but a lot of swimmers will take drugs to swim faster. Terrible people, don't ever do that. Very, very bad. So that might be because they don't get those butterflies anymore. So when you guys get those natural butterflies, that's like a natural stimulant to go fast. So it's a very good thing when you feel like you have that anxiety, you just need to learn to channel it. So what, one of the things that really helps is if you take a pair of goggles, right, and you toss it back and forth like this. But the trick is, like this, this is real, okay, the trick is you have to follow it with your eyes back and forth. And what this does, each eyeball is connected to a separate part of your brain. And when you move it back and forth, it kind of calms down the hectic motion that's in your brain going on. Like this is a real thing. It's a really good strategy and a, a really good therapy, okay? And it's not silly, right? Like I'm not asking you to go out there and wave your arms and make feel better. You can do that and that helps too. But what you can do really is you can go and sit in a quiet corner and just toss your goggles back and forth, making sure that your eyes move back and forth like this, okay? That'll calm you down a little bit, get you reset, ready to go. Another thing that I usually do is I put it, I'll put a towel over my face and just smile for like five minutes. Just smile. Because that'll send dopamine to the brain. I, I used to just sit there and smile, and then after a while I think I was freaking people out by just smiling at them as they were walking by, just holding a smile. So now I'll, I'll go in a quiet place, put a towel over my head, and I'll just smile. So smiling and tossing goggles back and forth are two really good tools that can kind of help get rid of your anxiety and help you reach that. Good. I like smiling. Smiling is my favorite. Hey, does anybody play basketball at all? So I used to play basketball a lot. And actually, I've never even thought about the connection with your eyeballs in the part of your brain, but I know I used to take the basketball and do the same thing. I just toss the basketball back and forth and you just it, it just calms you down. Believe it or not, as a coach, I actually will flip a kickboard 
on, while I'm coaching and it actually calms me down when you guys are not doing as good of a job focusing on your details as you could. All right, let's get someone from this section right here since those guys are too boring to ask one. So just right here, hands down. Who wants to do it? Oh, no, that was right here in the green. Get your name since I don't know it. What's your name? Grace. Grace, what's your question? Um, oh, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, oh, okay. when you're swimming, do you ever, like, um, kind of look around and look at other people and just look at And she's wondering, for those of you that couldn't hear, when you're swimming, do you just ever look around at the other people during practice? During practice, absolutely, everyone does. <laughs> um, so, my flip, my flip turns are open turns and breaststroke are actually the only time I ever see people when I race. So sometimes you use it as like a race strategy, right? Because when you're swimming breaststroke or butterfly, should you turn your head and look? Not really. Some butterflies will breathe with their head to the side, but especially if you're swimming breaststroke, you should never look because that turns your, your body posture, right? So when you look on the turn, it kind of gives you an opportunity to see where everyone else is in the field. That's a very good question. Any other questions on the side? Yeah, come on down. Who was your best coach? That's a tough one. Who was my best coach? So my longest coach, I'll start with that, um, is Steve Boltman. He was my college coach. But every, every coach that I've had, has been very, very special to me. So it's kind of like your best friend, right? Like you'll have a best friend in second grade, sometimes a best friend in fourth grade, and you can't really compare them. So I think that every coach I've had has done exactly what I needed when I had them. So right now, I'm, coach, I'm being coached by someone called Doug Jane, and he's coaching a professional group. And this is the first professional group I've ever trained with, and it's been a lot of fun. Right now, so when I was in high school, I was training like you guys, and then when I went to college, I started training a lot more. Guess how many hours a day we train? Four, five, or even six. Sometimes we train six hours a day. It was a lot of training. Um, and so it was very important to eat really healthy, sleep really well, drink a lot of water, and keep a happy brain. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, the biggest thing I did when I went to college is working on my head. And so there's a lot of really good exercises that you guys can do to continue to work on your head. Because if you are the strongest person in the world and you jump in the water and you don't want to do it, you're not going to swim very fast, right? Like your brain is such a powerful tool and every single Olympian on the planet has to have a strong mental side to their sport, right? So working on your head will get you so much farther than if you don't ever touch it at all. So. Right now, as a professional swimmer, we'll train about four hours a day. We'll do two hours of weight training and then two hours of swimming, and then lots of time working on our head. And we'll do that about six days a week, and then come here to places like Richmond and meet you guys. All right, let's, you guys want another crack at it? Anyone? Bueller? All right, let's ask right here. Hold on, hands down, starting right here, over. No pumpkin eaters. Who wants to do it? All right, Layla. When you were younger, how did you balance school and swim? So when I was younger, how did I balance school and swim? So this is a little tricky on my part, because I didn't start swimming club until my senior year of high school. So I started when I was about 17 years old. But this is how I did it in my senior year of high school. It's tough. It's really tough because you're at school for so long, right? And then you go to practice. So honestly, sometimes I would do homework during lunch. I know it's super boring, um, but I would do homework during lunch. And I would, right, when I was home, if I had time between practice, I would work on homework. And I would work on homework right after dinner. So sometimes it's just a very busy day where you have to take all the opportunities you have to study and work on homework. Um, but the biggest thing at the end of the day is just trying to relax. So sometimes I'll do different breathing exercises to see how slow I can make my heart rate. Do you guys ever check your heart rate? Yeah? So sometimes you can get a clock and see if you can focus on just breathing for one minute. Don't think about
about anything else. And if you start to think about something else, you can start over. So it's kind of like a game. And see how long you can focus on just breathing. Does that kind of answer your question to me? Yeah. Okay. This is this section right here. You can't be in two sections at once, even though you're really tall. All right, who wants it? Oh, right here, Michaela. Come on down. Are you always the fastest swimmer in your lane? Oh my gosh, let me tell you what. So, when I was swimming in high school, I got a little bit faster each time. I think I started my senior year with like a, a 109, I think, 100 breaststroke, and I got down to 102. Um, so every year I, I dropped, or every team, every meet I dropped about a second. But also, I'm very big, very strong, and I focus really, really hard every t every single time I went into the meet. Um, so I had like 10 years to make up for it in like four months. So if you guys are slowing down in your best times, it's because you've already been swimming really well. I started out pretty slow, and then I finally got up to it. So when I went to college, I thought it was going to be okay. I was like, I've had the hardest of my life, my senior year of high school, I'll be just fine. It turns out, when you start swimming clubs from the age of seven, eight, or nine, you do a lot better in college. And when you start club at 17, you don't do as well in college practice. So I never really did kick sets. How many of you guys do kick sets? So at AM, we did this kick set of 12 100. Right? Does everyone do that? Like lots of 100s for their kick sets? So we had an interval, a fast interval, of 100s on 125. And then we had the middle interval at 100s on 130. And then we had the slow interval on 135. And then we had the Korea interval at like 150. Like super, super slow. So sometimes I had to finish my kick sets in the in the diving well because I was holding everybody up. Um, but you know, I had to keep a positive attitude. And the best thing about being a slow kicker is there's nowhere to go but up. You guys can always get faster. You just have to keep working on it every single day. And progress is sometimes really slow, right? But it's always there slowly climbing. So if you guys are patient and really focus on your technique and work with your coaches, you'll become one of the fastest kickers. And guess who the fastest women are? The fastest kickers. So keep working on your kicking all the time, and you guys will definitely get faster. Just be patient with it. So when she, when Bria qualified in 2012, I was actually there. I got to watch. I got to watch that swim. It was really great. Um, she took out one of the, at the time, Rebecca Sony, who was regarded as one of the, the best breaststrokers in the world. But if you want to talk about the people that she was training with on a daily basis at Texas A&M? They put two different Americans on on the Olympic team, which is unheard of for a college team, and they had 12 different swimmers represented at the Olympics in 2012. So it's not that unusual that she wasn't leading her lane when she's surrounded by 11 other Olympians. All right, that was from here, right? All right, hands down. Who wants to ask it? Oh, no, Sophia, you can't do it again. All right, come on over, Abigail. She's persistent. What was your favorite thing in swimming? Probably food. I love food, and as long as I swim, I can eat a lot of food. Um, no, I, I really like the feeling in aerobic freestyle sets where you, you feel like the pump. You guys know what I mean? When you guys are working on aerobic freestyle and then you just feel really good and you feel like you can go forever, I love that feeling. Because one of my, my favorite quotes is from Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's, this pain is my privilege. And I think that is such a cool feeling. I don't know how many of you guys, do you guys remember what it feels like when you first start out the season and you don't feel very fast, right? Like you have a summer break, right? And you come back, you don't feel very fast. And then when you guys start to get a little bit faster and you get a little bit more in shape and you, you feel the pain of it, but it's like a good pain. You know what I mean? 
Like you finish the race and you know you're fast. I love that pain. I think it's the coolest feeling in the world because you guys earned it. Like no one else in this, on this earth can feel that pain but you. I think it's the coolest thing. And it's just something that you work so hard for and it's just like, it's like, it's like a present, right? It's like that pain lets you know how fast you've gone. And so I, I, uh, I, think, I know it's a weird answer, but I think pain is probably my favorite part of swimming. Pain and food, I mean, that's, I used to only think about food while I was going through the pain, so I agree. All right, this section right here, hands down. Who wants it? Oh, Henry Brooks, come on over. All right, Henry, what's your question? Um, was there ever any times that you felt like giving up on swimming? Were there any, ever any times I felt like giving up on swimming? A lot of times, actually. Um, so, in 2014, I graduated college, and some college swimmers continued to go on and be pro. Um, but I was pretty tired and I thought I needed a break, but I went on anyways and I kept going and kept going. And actually, this last summer, I swam really, really bad at national championships. And I thought I was going to quit and be done forever. So I took about six months off and I got a desk job, so it was very, very boring. And then I came back to the water and I fell in love all over again. So I've been swimming a little bit since January and I came back up now swimming full time. Um, but there's definitely a time very close that I thought I was going to be done forever. And I think it's just because, I, again, I wasn't being very nice in my head, right? And I wasn't having very much fun. And the, be the biggest thing you have to remember is you guys are in charge of the fun, right? You're in charge of making practice fun. So if you guys truly have a dream and you truly have a goal, you guys really need to strive for it and continue to make practice fun so you can keep going and swim fast. And so there, yes, it's the answer there's been a lot of times I wanted to quit, and one time I thought I was going to be done for good, but also I'm 26, so you're not allowed to feel like this yet, you guys have a long time. <laughs> keep swimming and having fun. Um, but how you get over it though is just by making it fun. So if you're having a hard time, talk to your coach. Uh, email me over Instagram or something. Find someone to give you some inspiration to keep going because it's definitely worth it. Since 2012, I've gone to travel to 32 countries to swim and now I have friends all over the world. And that's just because I decided to keep swimming. Really awesome things happen when you, can, when you find your goal and you continue to strive for it until you get it. Alright, I hear that these crazy boys over here actually want to ask a question. Who is it? Wilson, come on down. Wilson! All right, what you got? This is a question for a friend. What was the biggest time drop you've ever had? Time drop you've ever had? The biggest time drop. The biggest time drop was probably at the Olympic trials. Um, so I had never tapered long course before. Um, and so I'd never really done, so I, I think my fastest time was like a, maybe a 111 for 100 long course. And then at trials, I went down to 105. So I dropped about six seconds. That was really big. And I think my my first college dual meet, I think I dropped five seconds and then 200 breaststrokes. That was fun too. Yeah, like I said, I was at that that trials. Only true swim nerds knew who you were going into that, at least at that level. So when, when Rhea came in and made the team, that was a very, very remarkable thing. All right, you guys are doing great. What about right here? Come on over, Maggie. This is Maggie Caton. We call her Clutch Caton. She comes through in the clutch. Whether it's swimming with a broken pinky or taking a spot on a reel. What kind of music do I like to listen to? Um, if I'm feeling super anxious, sometimes I'll listen to classical music to calm myself down. If I'm feeling really calm and I want to ramp up, sometimes I'll just kind of turn on whatever, I guess. Just go on to Spotify and, and find a, a certain list. Um, but honestly, sometimes I get a little too nervous listening to a full song because I feel like I need to pay attention. Um, and I don't want anyone to steal my headphones because I get really nervous about that. So sometimes I really don't listen to a lot of music at swimming. I kind of like to use, 
I guess like use the, the water in the area, like I use like the world as my music, I guess, without headphones. You can just kind of listen around and get in the groove with the meat, watch everyone swimming in the water, listen to the music in the, in the overhead area. That's usually my go-to. Country music. Country music. <laughs> All right, over here, who's got a question? Bryce, come on up. How do you keep yourself committed to swimming? All right, so when you guys go home today, I want you guys to try and find a swim journal. I think writing things down are very, very important, okay? And you need to write down all of the good things about swimming. And I think it's very important to write down all the bad things too. Okay? So, so like, let's, if we sit down here right now and think of the bad things, who likes to wake up early? Not really. So, it's good if you do. So, I'll, so what I do is I write down, I don't like to wake up early. And then you write down why you wake up early. I wake up early because I want to be one of the fastest people in the world. What's another thing? I don't like being hungry in practice. Well, why are you hungry in practice? Because I'm working so hard to be one of the best in the world. I hate cold water. Who, who likes jumping into cold water? If you raise your hand, you're a little nuts. So, I do not like jumping in cold water. But I guess thinking of it, every time you jump into cold water, it's like one dollar towards your dreams, right? So I think it's good to write down everything you love about it and all, all the goals and dreams you have, then write down all the bad things and then why you're doing them. When, so when you have a reason to do something you don't like to do, it makes it a lot easier. Does that make sense? So that's one of the ways you can kind of help to keep yourself motivated to keep going for it. When, and when the list starts getting a lot bigger on the bad side than the good side, then you've got to start working on it. You've got to start working on all the bad things and say, why am I doing this? Figure out the reason why. If you're having a struggle, again, go back to your coach and tell them all the reasons why you're having a hard time and can help you realize why you're doing it. All right, I want to ask one. So we have, I remember growing up and I, I did a few sets over the years, more than a few, that were so hard that they just stick in your brain and you're never, ever going to forget that set. So what was the one, I'm asking for ideas, what was the one single hardest set that you remember ever doing that you finished and you're like, oh my goodness, that was amazing and awful. Oh dear. So I actually have this terrible book of all of the Olympians' worst workouts, and I've never I've never shared it with a coach because I'm afraid of that going viral. Um, but there's two really. One in college that I really struggled with was called countdowns, and I, and when we did the breaststroke, what it is, we do a long course or short course, but you have you start out with a 50 breaststroke on a minute and five seconds. Pretty easy, right? Then a minute and four seconds, minute three seconds, minute two seconds, minute 59, 58, 76, and you go down until you don't make it. So sometimes you touch and you know you have five seconds, and then when you get towards the end, you don't know when to go. And so your coach just yells out, go! And if you touch and you have half a second to breathe and you hear go, you gotta go. And so sometimes you go for like another almost 200 breaststrokes, just just swimming your guts out, not knowing when you're going to be able to stop. That was really hard. Uh, you know what? I honestly think I just blacked out the whole memory of it. <laughs> Maybe 30, 37 or 38 after like 8,000 breaststrokes. Uh, but no, the other one though that was really tough, um, we did 40 50s at 200 pace. And I know a lot of clubmen have done that, and maybe more. Um, and when you get sets like that, there's a way to slack off, and then there's a way to push yourself. When you can have a lot of rest, it's up to you how hard you push yourself, right? So if your coach gives you a minute rest between everything, you can choose how fast you swim. So by making those sets kind of a nightmare, you get better, if that makes sense. But again, the privilege is your pain, you earn it. Don't worry, guys. I got all those memorized. Oh. If we had the if we had the clocks that actually told you exactly when to go, maybe we could do that. I, I'm not confident we could do the math that quickly. All right, over here, who's got a question? In the back, come on up. 
Yeah, no, no. Oh, well, you already... We'll let both of you come down. All, all three of you, apparently. So we have Riley and Josie and Haley. We'll do a rapid fire round. All right. Riley. Yes. How old were you when you started USA Swimming? 17. That was her senior year. And she learned how to swim the day before. No, I'm kidding. At starting swimming at such an old age, how did you get yourself to stand out and become one of the best swimmers? I think part of it was not knowing how fast everyone else was. Um, I put a goal in my head, and I wrote it on my hand, I wrote it on my notebook, I made it my email password. I, I was obsessed with it. And I just asked my coach what I needed to do to get there. And I was so concentrated and so focused on trying to be the best in the water that day, and then the next day, and the next day. And then just shooting so high that every time I raced it in my head, it became a little bit easier. So my, my freshman year of college, I got second in both a 100 and 200 breaststroke. And I think I won a 58-6 in the 100 breaststroke. And the next year, I wanted to break the American record, which was 57-7-7. So I thought, I'm going to go 57-7-5. So I thought about it every single day, and I raced it in my head over and over and over. So every time I went up to, up to the blocks, it seemed a lot easier. I was like, well, I've already done this in my head a million times. I'm going to do it today. I didn't always get there, but at the very end of the season, I won a 57-7-1, broke the American record, and then went on to win trials. The brain is a very, very powerful thing. So I want you guys to think about this really quick, okay? When you start going your head and you go to the blocks, I want you guys to notice the conversation you're having with yourself, okay? A lot of the time, swimmers are always giving themselves permission to swim slow. And what I mean by that is if you go to the blocks and you're like, well, I'm kind of tired, point. I'm kind of hungry, point. I had a really bad week of practice, point. You just gave yourself three points and three excuses to swim slow, right? You gotta do the opposite. You gotta go in front of the blocks and you gotta say, I've been working really hard at practice, point. I don't need food to swim fast, point. I'm confident I can do this, point. Give yourself all the reasons to swim fast instead of swim slow, okay? That's a very, very important thing. And the fastest swimmers are always doing that. So practice working on your head. Your, head, your brain is just like a muscle like everything else, right? If you stop working on it, it gets a little bit weaker. So you have to continue to work on it all of the time. How did you feel when you got to cue? Okay, so real quick. I didn't get DQ, they got very lucky. Um, so it was a technical malfunction. 26, 32, 42. So there's always ways to get better. So if we are upset about our race, give yourself five minutes to feel it, because it's a real feeling, right? It's a real feeling. And you're human, so you're allowed to feel it. Give yourself five minutes to feel sad, feel angry, and then go to your coach and ask how you can get better. I think sometimes you can give yourself those five minutes in the cool down pool and swim, swim that feeling out. All right, I want to ask one. So, Bria said she's been to 32 different countries. Has anybody been to more than 32 different countries? Yeah, have you, have you guys been to 32 countries total between all of you? You went to the Bahamas, right? So, I just got back from a week in France last night, so I am... It's, it's, yeah, jet lag is a real thing. Uh, there's a thing called culture shock. Whenever you go to a different country and things are so different that you're kind of in shock and you don't really know what to do. What is the, do you have any good culture shock stories or stories from visiting other countries that maybe would be fun to share? Uh, I think the biggest culture shock was India. Um, so going to India is very different, especially if you're six foot tall, white, and blonde. It's, it's strange when you're walking down the street and everyone is pointing at you. Sometimes they're laughing, sometimes they're just smiling, and sometimes they're shaking their finger. <laughs> um, and the food is always a little bit different too. Um, but honestly, I love every single country that I've been to. I think it all, they always offer really great lessons and it makes you very grateful for what you have. Um, and just knowing that 
a smile is a universal language. So you can smile at anyone else in the world and they know that you're happy and that you come in peace, if that makes sense. So your five minutes of practicing smiles before all of your races came in handy in every single country. All right, here's what we'll do. We'll go one, two, three more questions, and then we'll give you guys a chance before the meet gets started. If you want to come up and ask your own question, maybe not in front of everybody, if you didn't get a chance to get a picture, get an autograph, we'll go ahead and do that. Is that okay? All right, we'll go three more. Anybody over there? Henry, come on up. This is Henry Cardo, also known as Pen Dog. What's your favorite stroke and why? We can't figure out what her favorite stroke is. Okay, I think it's pretty obvious that breaststroke is your favorite stroke, but why is breaststroke? You get to breathe every single stroke every single time. I haven't paid attention to you standing, but I'm guessing you probably stand like this. There you go, that's a strong breaststroke foot. All right, let's get one from the center crowd entirely, okay? All right, between you and you, all right? Sophia and Aaron, hands down. Who wants to ask? Oop, Sophia, all right. Macaroon, I saw a lot of macaroons in France this week. I thought of you often. That's her nickname, Macaroon. What do you eat before you swim? What do you eat before you swim or yeah? So before morning practice, they usually have five or six eggs, a tomato and an avocado. Um, if I'm not a swimmy, then I probably just go with the drink and sandwich. All right, next thing. Last question. Oh, you, you gotta do it. Yeah. Front row, right here. Let's Um, really quick to you guys. So, wait a second. Hold on. Okay. Um, I wanted to let you guys know in case you might be interested. So, I'm part of this really cool program called Rise. And what we are is we're mental coaches. So, we help mentor young athletes like yourself for 30 minutes once a week. Um, it's a really cool program and we work a lot on working with your head and building confidence in and out of the pool and how to create a more balanced life between school, friends, and family, and swim. Um, if you guys are interested, I'll see you over here a little bit later and you can give me your email, your parents' email, and I can send you guys more information. Does that sound good? That does not surprise me one bit after listening to you talk. All right, what do you guys think? Was this pretty great? All right, let's give a big cheer for Bria. Thank you very much. Now don't forget that you guys are all invited to stay right now.